Hi there. Hi there. So uh, I don't know if we're going to be joined by anybody else uh, today. I uh, haven't heard anything from from Tara that she might be joining us in a in a little while. Mm. Um, we can probably spend a little bit of time today talking about uh, the Jenkins X side of things because it would certainly be good to um, start to uh, set out some reference implementations of some of these best practices and you know show how that you can uh, you can do that in you know a, a platform like Jenkins X mm. that would be excellent so at least start to plan what we are to figure out what we need to, uh, to plan. Yeah, so um, let me just uh, fire over to this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what we've got in here is a uh, a series of, of different sections uh, where you know we're we're trying to encourage the development of this best practices site with additional content. So obviously the the primary content is is in the learn section, um, mm. but what we would like to do is you know build up um, some general resources, but also to in the community section to actually have uh, some, if you like, worked examples or references from uh, community projects uh, showing how, how we can leverage those tools to, uh, to actually build on best practice. That's awesome. So I had a, uh, had a short look at this uh, site, but I didn't read it all yet. Yeah, so it, it I, I think it's it's relatively straightforward in 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 terms of all of the the beats that it touches on. Mm -hmm. Um but it's not necessarily obvious to everybody how you get from a theoretical understanding of what needs to be done to actually having an implementation of that that will serve a team or an organization. Yeah. Now, obviously, Jenkins X already does um, a, a large chunk of what we've got in best practices. Uh, but suffers from the opposite problem, which is that, you know, it's a, a magic thing that you install um, and then you need to spend the next two years working out what it can do for you because it does so much that uh, it, it's you're almost discovering its capabilities by accident, by stumbling across them rather than uh, having a, a clear vision for how the tool is going to support you in your business needs yeah absolutely and that's about um, documentation for one thing and uh, you know there's also some un unknown code here and there so we need to kind of get uh, get into it and uh, try to um, align with uh, with how, how you define continuous uh, delivery and um, how to solve that and then see and um, See how Jenkins X lines up. So I think for uh, continuous integration, um, I'll have to look closer at that, but I, I know there's, there's one thing that we don't do, and that is with, uh, with the GitOps um, drift detection. Is that part of this guide as well, or is that would you consider that outside? So that's not something that we've gone into great detail on at the moment. 
um, but it, it's it's likely to be something that we you know develop uh, over time as 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 we refine what's there at the moment. Uh, so I, I think you know, a, a a good first step really would be to to have some sort of you know white paper um, that would map the the basic concepts that are in the best practices guide mm. onto capabilities within the Jenkins X platform. Sure. Um, and and that that can be done in in a a sort of narrative style so it it can be relatively conversational uh and it probably needs to be done at a different level so i would say the first thing to do would be just to do a general conversation about how each big chunk piece in best practices fits to what jenkins x does and then that can be the the kind of overview introduction to best practice with Jenkins X, mm. and then later you you could drill down into your more detailed examples of solving mm. particular problems using using that platform. Mm. I'm ready to uh, do that. And con contribution on on this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, the uh, the whole site is uh, within the CDF uh, GitHub repos. There's a uh, uh, best practices site repo, and you can just submit PRs. Nice. Uh, so the whole site is just hugo documentation so it's yeah. pretty much the same as the the jenkins x documentation site was so, yeah uh, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with that so that, that's very good so is that something that the team is going to have capacity to to look at do you think uh, yeah, you know, I think that I can manage to uh, to do this. This will also be. Uh, I think this will also align with my, my company how, how they want to want to work with you know best practices and uh, and uh, kind of be aligned on uh, things like agile agile um, work management <laughs> work modes. I think this goes very well in, into that uh, that system. And I I think from a CDF perspective, uh, it it would be a really worthwhile thing to be doing because you know, it looks like the focus this year is going to be on you know trying to get more reference examples of all of these patterns and. and mm start to tie together the work that's been done previously so that it's easier for people to get from a theoretical understanding to you know actually consuming these projects and, and using them uh, in in ways that add value mm. uh, and obviously it's going to be a, uh, a a great way to help promote uh, adoption from a Jenkins X perspective uh, mm. Because if you can you know, demonstrate a you know a strong fit to best practice, then uh, it it becomes much easier to uh, to get people on board and and using the the tools. Yeah, definitely. So I see Tracy's joined us. Hi, Tracy. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello. So um, I missed the best practices session at CDCon, just ended up having loads of flight problems. So I just saw the videos were posted today. So I'll go check it out. But I was wondering if what well, the quick summary of how it went was. Uh, yeah, we, we had a, a, a 
an amusing conversation um, and uh, we picked on people out of the audience and uh, made them answer difficult questions about uh, their their processes um, so uh, it it went well I think it was uh, it was a fun little uh, little session ah, cool yeah looking forward to catching up with that yeah just been out uh, for a while so just in general um, catching up with the state of things and seeing where I can help yeah well uh, certainly things are seem to be moving fast on the uh, supply chain security side of things so yeah. it, it would be good to to keep the documentation um, at pace with the the evolution of, of you know best practice and solutions out there in the marketplace yeah for sure i can help with that uh, and you know again i think our, our focus now needs to be on starting to get more reference examples into the, the site so that we can uh, we can start to point people at projects and give them examples of you know, how things have been successfully achieved in in, in different areas of uh, you know, continuous delivery in general. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, I, I, I don't know if there's anything that you uh, you might be able to put together from a uh, you know white paper perspective that we can include in the community section. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, maybe one thing that springs to mind is I have a, a colleague who is in the Kubernetes community, and I've seen him give a talk around like how they took use the salsa levels to incrementally kind of evaluate where they want supply chain security and then work through um, what they could fix and improve like adding s bombs and then um, code signing and and all the the different things they tackled and the problems they're they're hitting would it be that kind of thing yeah i think i mean i recently i've i've seen you know a, a number of demos from people who are building practical solutions in the space um and and the challenge always seems to be with those demos that there's a an abstract talk at the beginning about all the scary things that can happen to your mm -hmm. supply chain um and then there's a, a a demo of magic happening uh but there's a huge gap in the middle uh, of of the whole what's the, what are the concepts what's the mindset uh, how do you actually need to approach this from a practical perspective and you know where do certain tools add value in in this whole puzzle yeah uh, so it would definitely be good to get uh, some some content in there that that goes from the you know, the abstract theory that we we've got on the on the best practices learn side yeah um to you know more more examples of you know solving specific problems in 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 that space cool yeah and i wonder if we can get some of the tecton folks um they were talking about the practical ways um they're trying to improve tecton from a, a supply chain security and i think there was a talk or i've seen a document where they sort of go through all the different criteria and things. I wonder if that, that would be a nice practical example to include somehow. But yeah, okay. uh, I, I think it, it would be very good to, uh, to, to have a, a, a Tecton specific you know, white paper that, that, that goes through the, the capabilities that the tool brings and how they address you know, some of the broader challenges. Right. Yeah, I can speak to Andrea about that, but I'm um, sure. Yeah, I'm sure I'm see I've seen a really interesting document. I think we could clean up or 
fashion into a white paper with some context around it and connect to this. I'll look for a link. And I, I think that's obviously going to be an area where Jenkins X is going to be incorporating capabilities in, in that space. So it's another set of examples that we can look at in the future of how, how Jenkins X is using those tools to simplify that, approaching that mm -hmm. problem set. Yeah. One question on Jenkins X, maybe for you, Christopher. Does Jenkins X do anything with tecton chains at all? Uh, no, we don't do that. Um, we, or actually, we have a um, Google Summer of Code student who will work mm -hmm. on the um, software supply chain security. Nice. And he is starting uh, this week, I think, or next. So we will see what what uh, what he can uh, can do for us. If it's tech yeah. on chains or something else, we, we will see. Yeah, no, that should be super interesting. Ooh. And feel free to loop him into the best practices uh, discussion or point him at the documentation so that you know we we we've got some continuity of concepts and uh, spanning across because it'd be nice to work from from that best practice almost like a a set of high level requirements uh, and and then drill down yeah. into actual capabilities. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to talk, talk with him when it begins. Um, even there are no there are plans to join the security SIG. There is a proof one. So I think it's going to be a year of sort of gluing things together because uh, there's lots of capabilities now out there and evolving quite quickly. Um, and, and if we can keep pace with that and uh, just start hooking those things together, it's definitely going to uh, be very beneficial overall. Yep. Yeah, nothing else from my side. Okay, well, um, it doesn't look like anyone else is going to be joining us. Um, so uh, I, I think we're, we'll continue with the current schedule of meetings um, because it would be nice to keep the momentum going and you know try to, to fill out the gaps that we've currently got in in the documentation set. Yep, looks for me. Um, it, it, it would also be good if we could maybe encourage a few more people to to get involved and and now start pick up picking up on the next level of work because yeah, we're we're mostly there with the 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 general best practice um, and, and we can go into more sort of maintenance mode on that now uh, but yeah, really the the important piece for this year will be uh, about aligning all of the all the projects within the CDF so that they've all got um, a connection from best practice through to implementation on those projects. Um, uh, and then there's also a lot of opportunity for uh, members to get involved in you know writing white papers about how they're solving particular problems in their organizations or with with clients and, and and so we get a much broader much more inclusive view of uh, of how to approach the challenges yeah. i think you know, next step really is for us to spend a little bit of time evangelizing um back amongst the the cdf membership um to you know encourage people to think about you know, contributing at a different level now yeah do you know if the talk meetings are running over the summer uh yes they're they're still on the same schedule as they were previously um they'll probably move time slot once the the two new members are elected 
Um, there's going to be another vote on when it will occur, but uh, other than okay. that, it's continuing to to operate. Yeah, I can't make the current slot, but um, that'll be interesting if they change. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure when uh, when that election completes, but I imagine it's uh, it's sometime in the next week or so. Uh, um, there will be a um, a new vote on times as soon as that uh, the new cohort joins the top. Okay, well, uh, I think in that case, I'll give everybody the rest of their time back and uh, we'll, we'll speak again in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good to see you all. Uh, yep. If you have a minute, Terry, I would love to discuss yeah. for a little bit with you. Yeah, sure. Um, just kind of thinking about this whole um, idea of uh, continuous delivery and kind of, I think you touched about it in your or one of the documents here about uh, there's a difference between when you uh, if you if you if you, if you know something or if you believe you have found something to be true and you want to implement that that's one mode and another mode is when you're kind of you know that it's kind of more vague area you don't you are more unsure of the territory what to do so i think that kind of uh, if you ideally idealize these two modes one of them is the classic waterfall model where you actually know everything or you believe you know everything in front sometimes you can actually know quite a lot but not everything but other times you know a lot less so you know in the one one mode optimizes for experimentation and the other for uh, more stability you yeah. understand where i'm going yeah yeah so the i mean the key, the key part about that is that all, all of these tools that we have for continuous delivery and devops and things like that they're all born within the the iterative exploratory model of the world so when 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 we say you know there's a there's three orders of magnitude difference in your productivity between you know the lowest performers and the highest performers those statistics apply to the the businesses that are doing product commercialization in this product discovery way of looking at the world mm. so whilst you can apply continuous delivery and all, all all of the tooling in a in in a more strategic you know long-term planning model of the world it doesn't give you many of the benefits in in, in return uh, because you just don't get that massive acceleration uh, because the the rest of the organization is effectively fighting against the optimizations within the the technology so there's not much point in being able to do continuous delivery if it takes you six months to get legal sign off on everything before you can put it live. Uh, so, so that's why that stuff is really important. Um, because for many organizations, if they, if they genuinely need to go faster in order to survive as an organization, then they need to understand that the problem isn't actually in their engineering team. The problem is that they need to restructure the organization mm. to be able to in, enable a more efficient engineering team to 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 deliver for them yeah sure um i totally get uh, get those uh, differences you're talking about there um 
um, but but even within one project, you could have like you create a, you know you need to um, sell tickets, and then have a feature that um, sets the price on the ticket and allow it, allow it to sell. Uh, but you can have you know, do experiments on top of of this again, where you don't necessarily have the same demands to to um, you know stability or test coverage or even security perhaps. Um, I don't know. It, I just there's some thoughts I have if if we can if if we should introduce some kind of dual uh, duality here. Well, I think what what I found in in practice is that it it can be quite harmful for organizations to start adopting tooling that's designed for a model that doesn't match their 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 own business model um, because what happens and and I see this a, a lot is that um adoption of these methodologies is often driven from within an engineering team so there'll be a group of developers or a cto who who see this stuff and go well we could use all of that and we could go much faster um, and so they push to implement the engineering bits of that and they make big promises to to the business about how that's going to transform everything but they don't attempt to tackle any of the structural problems within the business itself. Um, and so what happens is that they, they invest a lot of time and money in buying new tooling and setting up the teams and training the teams. Um, and then what they find is they're not getting the user stories into the system at a fast enough cadence to to keep the pipeline full and then they're getting to the point where the coding and testing on something is done and they want to put it into production but they can't because there's seven or eight other business units who all have paper sign off on that and it takes them between six weeks and six months to each do their part of the process and so you just end up with backlogs at the beginning of the end and the engineering team is more efficient but it's actually then spending most of its time just sitting around cooling its heels because it doesn't have anything else to do because it's waiting on everybody else uh, and then what happens is instead of the business realizing that it's not delivering fast enough it just blames the engineering team for failing to magically make things go quicker. Uh, and then there's a backlash and everybody says, oh, DevOps doesn't work or continuous delivery doesn't work. Um, and then you have to throw it all out um, and you can no longer use any of it because it's it's been given a black mark uh, yeah. because it, it wasn't implemented correctly and it didn't deliver. So, so I always advise that when people are looking to do the transformation, the first thing they do is, is start the strategic plan for transforming the structure of the organization. Mm. Um, and that the, the engineering part of the tooling comes a fair way down the chain in terms of what you actually need to do if, you, if you're going to be successful at this. Yeah, yeah, I understand where you're going now. It's about simply, um, yeah, structuring the organization to allow rapid change, and and that also means um, kind of something about um, the you know you can't have all these sign-offs with five six different departments and all that. You have to be uh, give more responsibility to to uh, the ones who are closest to the. Um, to the, the the product and the market and the and the code, all of that, and um, 
Yeah, I'm actually thinking that, um, yeah, I'm thinking about my colleague who's an agile coach, is talking about the methodology, which is called uh, tight, loose, tight, which is about, which is often teaches to uh, government organizations in Norway and abroad. Not very much abroad, but at least in Norway. About um, how we should uh, make sure to define uh, a vision first, where you give give the employees an idea what what they want to achieve, and then we let them loose to solve the problem. And after they have returned with the <clears throat> solution, you compare the solution with what your idea was. So that's the second type. And, and, and this mindset gives uh, a lot of freedom and it also gives uh, the, the management also a lot of um, ease or ease, easing their burdens because they don't really have to go and check that everything works all the time. So the classic problem in this space is in understanding the difference between a startup and, and a mature enterprise or government department mm. because they're very very different in in the way that they behave so intrinsically in a startup all of your employees are motivated by the value of the company because the salary is not very good but you stand to to make all of your rewards uh on the exit price so so the more effective the company the higher its valuation and and the the higher the value it will exit at so so every, everything is focused on the price of the shares which means that everyone is highly motivated to do whatever's necessary to maximize the customer experience so that you get more customers you retain your customers longer and you get you know more engagement and all of those things push up the value of the business mm. there's very close coupling between the rewards mechanism and the correct behavior to improve a customer's prop on a pro solving a customer's problem mm. now if you look at a um a conventional mature enterprise with a you know, a long-term product or a government department that's trying to solve a particular social problem. Mm. There, the structure and the incentives are very different. So you typically have a strategic plan, which is these are the goals that we want to try and achieve over the next year. And then everyone is rewarded purely with salary perhaps with some level of, of bonuses attached but that salary and the bonuses are all linked to achieving milestones on the strategic plan so once a year you set out all of this strategy you set out all of the rewards for everyone on the team based on that strategy mm and then you send them out to go and do it now if at that point people working closely with the customer discover that the customer doesn't want what's in the strategy mm. and instead they want something else well if they're using continuous delivery they can react to that and change what they're producing but at that point, they're no longer delivering against the strategic plan. Mm. So they're failing on the plan, even though mm. they're succeeding in business. Yeah. And what exactly. happens there is that the employees mm. will often start to sabotage the people who are trying to solve customer problems. Mm because they know that they won't get their bonuses if they don't deliver the milestones that are in the plan. And so the plan suddenly conflicts with business success and the majority of your staff 
tend to opt to sticking to the plan rather than solving the business problems. Um, yeah. And then, then what happens is that you get this you know, internal corporate antibodies where the, the organization fights change um, because it's incentivized not to change. That's a very interesting uh, thoughts on, on discussion and had exactly these or similar discussions about uh, loyalty and how uh, actually loyalty can be a really bad thing in the situation you just described, where you're loyal to the goals of your uh, business or to your boss, to your boss's goals. But when those uh, goals are actually detrimental to the customers or to, to the, even to the whole business, then uh, you have to, the right thing would be to be loyal and, and help uh, both the business and the customers. But um, that depends on the culture, of course. And uh, really, it, it doesn't have to be the money reward also. In, in Norway, we have the largest social security uh, government agency. They are using uh, this met method and they have small, small teams with. Uh, so it is possible even in the government structures. Yeah, it, you can you can work around the problem. Um, but you you have to recognize that the the culture of your organization is directly linked to your capability to iterate fast or slow. Yeah. Uh, and so really the bulk of continuous delivery as a methodology sits in the business space rather yeah. than in the tooling space. Yeah. Uh, and the, we, we, we can do things in the tooling space to make it simpler to roll this stuff out and simpler to maintain it and reduce the overall cost of ownership. Mm. Uh, but you can't fix the overarching problems just with the technology. Uh, and in fact, you can make it worse with, with just the technology if you, mm. if you don't first tackle the, the, the overarching conceptual challenges. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It has no, the, to start the, the, uh, culture from the from the top, or yeah, it, it will fail if you don't have the have the culture from the top with, with uh, involved in, in this. Now, what's really nice about the tools like Jenkins X is their ability to provide um, a very simple path into that new methodology um, by lowering the barrier to entry. So obviously cloud native is, you know, the, the ultimate technology stack, if you want to be able to iterate very fast and, and, and have very, very short loops into production, but the learning curve to get into cloud native is, is, pretty vertical um, and it generally takes people about a year to to get competent in using those those technologies and probably three or four years to get really really fluent in delivering in that space in a reliable and secure way mm. now but jenkins x is nice because bundles up most of that complexity and hides it at the beginning. Mm. So, so you, you've got something that you can, you can deliver into an organization um, and it initially puts you on rails. So, you know, as long as you, you follow the way of working, you're getting mm. all of the main benefits of using that cloud native infrastructure without having to understand how any of it, is wired up yeah um, and then as you start to want to do more complicated things in your application you start to run up against the the edges of what you know how to do 
but then you're trying to you're, you're limited to solving one problem at a time so it smooths out that learning curve over a much longer period and you still need people in your organization who will get to the point where they do fully understand what's going on under the hood but you've bought them a lot more time in which to safely learn uh, all of that information mm. and really integrate it into their understanding of how how the system mm. works mm. yeah yeah right and i, I was uh, what you said now i was thinking that uh, we want to start looking at uh, cd events and uh, cloud events so uh, perhaps that can be a kind of if you had support for that i imagine we can swap out parts of the system with other uh, other tools can, yeah so uh, I, th I think this is a it's a two layer problem really mm. y you've got the 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 business facing layer which is what will customers actually want to be able to do with this platform mm. um and those are the patterns that we've codified in the best practices uh, yeah. documentation. So that, if you like, is your high level requirements for what any customer will expect from a continuous delivery platform. Yeah. Um, but then you've got this lower level piece, which is, oh, we want to be able to follow best practice, but we have a preference in terms of the infrastructure that we're using or a particular piece of tooling or a particular vendor. Um, and so that's where being able to plug different components in mm. makes it easier for uh, some customers to, to adopt because they have hard stops in terms of, you know, what their enterprise architecture allows in, in, in terms of tooling. So you know, you'll find a, a a lot of organizations will be heavily Microsoft constrained, and so mm. it, you know, it, it's it's not just a case of being able to operate on an Azure platform, but you need to actually be able to tie into uh, a a lot of that Microsoft tooling in order for the developers to actually feel comfortable using it and for the business to feel comfortable authorizing it. Mm, all right. Um, so uh, in many cases, it's, it's a cultural problem again, but couched in, in, in vendor specific terms. Mm. Yeah. Now we are creating a user interface that we hope will replace the whole JX command line interface. So that will help for Windows users. And again, it's it's one of those cases where you've always got to remember that you've got two demographics that you're addressing. You've got the um, the new users who want to be supported in learning how to use the platform and then you've got the power users who uh, who want to be able to use it as quickly and efficiently as possible mm. and usually those two demographics have competing needs uh, so when you solve for one you end up upsetting the other um, mm. uh, and so you, you almost have to budget for having two completely independent ways of, of addressing any system so that you're, you're balancing out the, the needs of both communities. Yeah, I think that's all. You have to be careful with, uh, with that, but yeah, but, uh, we have uh, one summer student is working on the software supply chain security and the other one on the user interface. So they are both important things to have in place. Yeah. And it, it uh, that, that user interface problem is a is a big challenge. Um because Jenkins X has had 
three or four user interfaces now mm. um and n none of them actually ended up solving the underlying problems mm. in 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 any sort of complete way uh so it, it is a big rabbit hole that you go down because of course you quickly hit the the bound that problem of you know where is the boundary between jenkins x and just pure kubernetes and how much of this stuff do we need to control from this user interface uh before you bounce people out into another user interface and then that might be fine for your expert users but then you're confusing your new users because mm. they don't know where that boundary is or where they go when they can't mm. do what they need to do in in your interface that's a valid point so i think we'll try to keep the native kubernetes resources out of out of it but it's kind of just started and um, at the moment, it's about being able to start and stop pipelines in addition to viewing the logs. So it's kind of proceeding step by step. Yeah, I, I think visibility is mm. a, is always going to be a key part. So mm. um, helping people to quickly understand where something is broken uh, yeah. it is it is very useful um, yeah. and uh, i think the the challenge is that lots of people who come to this are, although they might be used familiar with a client server kind of architecture they'll still have been mostly dealing with monolithic single threaded applications that that have a, a concrete flow uh, uh, and so the the main challenge is getting people to understand that you're in a you know a distributed parallel environment now mm. and that multiple things are happening simultaneously in many different places on different servers but they're all interconnected and communicating and therefore uh, you can't easily follow through a single thread because you know, things are forking into multiple processes and and stuff can fail at any, any point within that uh, so it becomes that much harder to uh to provide a a, a good view on what's happening uh, and the way i i used to work was was to basically have a 4k monitor full of terminal windows providing multiple different views on bits of the system mm. and then when i was deploying things uh, i would be able to observe the behavior of multiple facets of the system uh, mm. and then see where stuff had got stuck um, fairly easily because you you you're looking from fifty thousand feet on mm. on on multiple views uh, whereas most of the previous user interfaces were trying to be a bit more jenkins like and saying you know here's a pipeline view and you keep drilling into things and, yeah. uh, but you're the problem right. is that you you when you've got these deeply nested forking uh processes you don't know where to drill into until you've done that 50 or 60 times and have got a feeling for what's going on and where it breaks uh, yeah so you you almost need to get that you know multiple windows on mm. on all the activity rather than try and make a hierarchical model of what's going on Yeah, we're working with at least error handling on the pipelines and, and, and that. And um, yeah, but definitely there's a lot, lot of systems uh, to handle. And um, yeah, I think it's, mo it's mostly about uh, <clears throat> yeah, 
take them to our plan as uh, errors and uh, how much further they will go in uh, debug or in uh, logging and adding. Like, uh, yeah, you know, I can't really add the uh, handling of things like DNS and uh, certificates and all that into into the same UI. That will be kind of too much. Yeah. Another. Now, in, in in my experience, pipeline failures were actually relatively rare, um, yeah. and so the 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 most common failures were um, the Git webhooks mm. not getting through or not tr triggering correctly, um, certificates not getting provisioned. In, mm. in a timely manner um mm. and you know basic problems mm. with you know kubernetes yaml not being generated correctly uh so stuff mm. would break uh, outside of the system mm. and there was it was very hard to find that because uh often it was it, it was edge cases sitting around the the outside of the system um, mm. which wasn't even communicated to the user that this stuff was going on yeah um so you needed to drill into some obscure bit of the application to find out that there were extra logs that you didn't even know existed in mm. modules that you didn't know were running that would tell you that you know okay that thing was sent from GitHub, but it didn't arrive, uh, um, or GitHub never sent it. Um, yeah. So th th those those types of problems are the 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 ones that most people get stuck on. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I was when we were talking about thinking perhaps we could add some trace ID to the things, but um, I don't know if that's even possible with this interconnected systems when well, if there was think, a, yeah. you can you can take an observability approach mm. so you 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 can you can start to provide a lot more information from individual modules back mm. to a place where you can choose to then expose views on that mm. uh, so the, and then once you've got that information, you can start to set expectations. So, you know, if mm. you've made a, a commit using the tooling into a GitOps repository, would you expect certain things to happen in the near future in other areas of the application? Right. So then you can start to design monitoring systems that are making assertions about expectations and then tracking to see if they happen. Mm. Uh, and then that helps you to then build smarter systems that say, oh, well, the user did this and I was expecting the following things to occur, mm. but they didn't. Right. Um, and I, I know at the, the first point at which I should, I should have seen some activity and I didn't see activity there. Therefore, the problem is upstream of that. And you can then tell the user to go and look in a particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's almost like it's the, the reverse of uh, logging as you're going along. It, it's, it, it's saying you should expect mm -hmm. to see a log generated from this place, mm -hmm. but that log never arrived. Therefore, your problem is in this area and you need to go and investigate that. Mm. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Uh, and of course that's much easier to do in a, you know, a, a cloud native in, in environment because you can, you can just fire off lots of little things that just sit there and wait for something to happen and then clean them mm. themselves up afterwards. Mm. So it's definitely got a huge amount of potential still as a platform for making cloud native 
fundamentally more accessible for people. Mm. Definitely. Just get rid of the bugs first. Okay, well, um, feel free to shout if you need a hand with anything. Um, and, sure. uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the talk. It was very nice. All right. Bye. Cheers then. Bye-bye.